Hello, and thank you for joining me. Uh, today's video is all about the checklist, the, the mental checklist that I run through in my brain before pretty much every photo shoot that I do. Now, I've been a professional photographer for nearly 30 years, and I've covered thousands of assignments all over the world, all kinds of different things, and this checklist is something that has evolved for me over that time, and I'll quite often find myself repeating it as I drive down the road when I'm going off on assignment. Now, this pretty much applies to any shoot that I do, whether it's a, a kind of long overseas shoot in sort of a remote place, or whether it's something really close to home and really rather simplistic. I'll typically run through the same process in my brain. Now, this might not be for everybody, because obviously I'm a professional and I need to take more equipment with me than some other people might, but even if you're just shooting on your iPhone, there'll pr probably be something in my checklist that will help you improve your photography. So this is just my way of doing things and I thought it might be interesting if I shared some of the things that I do with you. So here we go. Research, it's a really important part of photography, often overlooked, and I have it on my checklist to make sure that I always have done at least some research before going on a photo shoot. And I don't think I've ever regretted any time that I've spent doing research before a shoot. It always kind of is a good investment of time. And Obviously all shoots are different. Sometimes the research can only take a few minutes before the shoot begins and other times it can be months in the planning. So I'll just give you a few quick examples. So let's say I was going to go and take some landscape photography for a travel client in an area that I've not been to before. I will do some, I'll look at a map, I'll look at some, I'll search the web for information about this area so that I can start to build up an idea of what it is that I need to shoot and where I might need to be to shoot it from. I'll check the weather, I'll check the sunset times, I'll check the sunset direction so that I uh, I know where might be a good place to orientate myself for those key times of the day. I might even look at some um, other photographers' work from that area to try and get some ideas and inspiration so that when I get there I can use my time really efficiently rather than running around not being quite sure what to shoot. Another example is corporate portraits. I do some corporate portraits every year pre-Covid for, um, for a big bank in London and I tend to have a very specific lighting set up and I tend to only have a few minutes with each person. They're very busy in and out. And so what I will do to plan for a shoot like that is I'll look back over the previous shoot that I might have done for them and I will kind of deconstruct the shoot and so I can work out what the lighting setup was, what lighting I used, what background I used, what gear I used and what settings I used. And most importantly probably I can start to remember what went well on the day and what the challenges were or what might not have gone so well so that I can iron all of those things out before the shoot actually starts. It ensures continuity for the client and the smooth running on the shoot day. Um, another probably good example, and the last one, is that if you're photographing a person, whoever it is, do a little bit of research into them. Sometimes I get portraits, um, portrait commissions from magazines of people, and I'll always do a bit of background research into the person so that we have something to talk about, and I know a little bit about them so I can start to build that into the, the photography so it's not just a bland picture of a complete stranger, it's something that says something about the person and their personality. Whatever you're shooting and whatever cameras you're using, it's always worth just giving a little bit of thought to the, to the photography that you're going to be doing before you actually start taking pictures. So do some research. Power has to be one of the most important things on the list. I know it's obvious, but these obvious things can often be the things that fall through the gaps. So before each shoot, I always make sure I charge up all of my batteries. Even if I don't think I'm gonna be using that particular bit of kit, I'll make sure that it's charged up and I make sure that I've got multiple backup batteries as well. And I tend to number my batteries so that it's easy to tell what's charged up and what's flat. I will typically carry a charger with me as well. Quite often one of these USB battery blocks which can be good because you can plug it into the car or you can plug it into a USB battery pack or charge it up from your, your phone socket in the wall. Um, I tend not to try and use these things though because charging up on location or on assignment is pretty much the last stop for the desperate and I try to avoid it, try to make sure that I have more than enough power to get me through the day. Doesn't matter what cameras you're shooting on, just make sure that they're charged up before you go out to take pictures. There's nothing more frustrating than getting somewhere and finally getting the really nice light or finding a really incredible composition and you suddenly find yourself with the battery flashing in your camera and you don't have enough power. Everybody's done it, 
just try and avoid it as much as possible. That's why battery power is always right at the top of my checklist. Logistics, it's all about making shoots run smoothly. I'm not talking about cameras or creativity, this is all about timings, travel. If you're driving to a shoot, do you know where you're gonna park? Have you got enough money to pay for the car parking? What are you gonna eat if you get hungry? What are you going to drink? Have you got the right clothes to wear? Have you got the right boots in case it starts raining and it gets muddy so that you can carry on shooting? If there's someone with you, do they have all the right stuff as well and something to eat and drink? If you're staying overnight, do you know where you're going to be staying? I don't think it really matters how big or small a shoot is. It might be a sunset mission close to your house, in which case you'll probably have the logistics pretty much down, but there's always something to consider and think about whether you need to take an extra coat with you or not. And if it's a bigger mission, like let's say a big photography adventure overseas, then you've got a lot of logistics to think about. Logistics ensure that the shoots run smoothly. I've, had, I've been saved so many times by having thought in advance, specifically around things like timings and things like car parks and things like directions of how am I gonna get to where it is that I need to get to. By planning those things in advance, I have really saved myself so many times. And so I always make sure that the logistics are on my checklist. And it just ensures that the shoot runs smoothly and you iron all of the problems out early. And then you can really focus your attention on your photography and you don't have to worry about the small details on the day. Clean your lenses. Don't just assume that they're okay. Before every shoot, I clean my lenses. I've learned this the hard way. Before every shoot I clean them and then during the shoot I will give them a check to make sure I haven't stuck a great big sticky thumb mark on the back of one of the lenses while I've been changing it over. I learned this lesson the hard way, I'll tell you a story, a few years ago I was shooting in the Caribbean doing some most amazing opportunity to shoot this travel feature, it's a beautiful day, blue sky, crystal clear water, lovely sand, lovely crisp lighting and we had some models wearing primary coloured clothing. It was just, just a dream really and uh, after a few frames at the beginning of the shoot uh, everything was kind of looking so dreamy through the camera I actually almost had to like pinch myself to make sure I wasn't dreaming. Looked kind of there was this soft glow around everything and I took a few more frames and then I thought this isn't right and so I checked the equipment and I'd left a thin film of sun lotion all over the back of one of the lenses which was giving everything this really glowy uh, diffused effect which was kind of a nice look but it wasn't the look that we were after so I had to clean everything up and off we went again and we were okay but learning lessons like this the hard way mean that that's why cleaning my lenses always goes on my checklist and it's not something that I overlook it's quite obvious but it is something that if you try and build it into your routine then you'll ensure that you have clean lenses all the time and there's nothing worse than being in a, in a situation situation where you have just taken some amazing pictures and then you look at your lens and you realize that it could have been cleaner and so maybe the contrast of the picture won't be quite so good. The way that I clean my lenses, I just use one of these things, a blower, just to blow all of the debris off and then I will use a paintbrush, typically a good quality artist paintbrush or a lens brush to brush any other bits and pieces off and then I just typically have a lens cloth to give it a wipe with but I'm not fussy sometimes I even use my t-shirt you know sometimes I've probably cleaned my lenses with all kinds of things that are completely wrong and I wouldn't encourage you to do that get yourself a nice quality lens cloth and use that to give you give your lenses a good polish cameras lighting lenses all of that cool gear stuff I make a list a gear list before pretty much every big shoot where I write down all of the different equipment that I might need to fulfill that assignment to the best of my abilities. If there's anything missing I can rent it in and then I can start to think about how I'm going to pack it, which bags I'm going to use and also I can start to think about which backup uh, equipment I might need to take, you know a spare camera body and a few different lenses and a bit of extra lighting maybe. I know this is specific because I'm a professional photographer I might need to take more equipment than some others but I think anyone that's trying to improve their photography can benefit from thinking about the photography they're trying to achieve and then what equipment they might need to get it. So the, you know, a tripod is a classic example of, you know, people go out to take some pictures and it's the daytime and maybe they just leave their tripod behind. Whereas actually the light starts to drop, you get the lovely blue hour. And what you really wanted was a tripod so that you can get those lovely long exposure pictures. Um, I really hope that this helps um, people plan a little bit more in advance of their photography what equipment they might be able to take to ensure that they make the absolute most from their photography mission.
take a few seconds to reset your camera to your standard settings, just in case you've had any weird settings plugged in the night before or the day before from a previous shoot, like white balance, for example, or like high ISO, or like exposure compensation, or like RAW versus JPEG. Even with an iPhone, sometimes I find that I have live mode turned on, and I really hate live mode because it looks great on the iPhone, but actually kind of messes with the pictures afterwards when I want to put them onto the computer. So just take a look and make sure that you've got all of your settings where you want them to be, and then you can proceed knowing that you're going to get the best possible pictures. Memory cards, film, data, disk drive space. Have you got enough of all of that good stuff to enable you to get all of the pictures that you want from any given scenario? Don't find yourself going out with a camera with a memory card stuffed in it that's got loads of old pictures on and you're not sure how much space you've got because you're going to find yourself one day in a situation where the most incredible picture presents itself to you and you're going to have no disk space. It happened to me once years ago when I was shooting film actually and I was asked to cover a riot. A riot was happening in the city near the newspaper office where I was working and I ran out to cover this riot and I kind of thought it was going to be a quick, you know, a quick shoot, like a like maybe an hour. Um, and I grabbed a handful of film, I think I grabbed six rolls of film, put them in my in my in my camera bag and then sort of two hours later I'd shot four or five rolls of film just as the riot just this demonstration just burst into violence and got really aggressive and there were police fighting and tear gas and people attacking each other and it's really rather intensive and it was something that really needed to be photographed but I only have one roll of film left to shoot it with and I, I was having to be really really rationed with my photography because of that. I managed to, to borrow a couple of rolls of film off of somebody else but it left a little bit of a lasting impression in me of always making sure that you've got enough film or data. You know, Now obviously we're shooting digital mostly and this stuff's cheap you know you can buy these memory cards for not a great deal of money anymore so there's not really a huge excuse for not having enough data Data. I get into a really tight, strict routine of whenever I come back from a job, I take my memory card, I copy it onto a hard drive, I back it up, and then I format the cards. And whenever I'm going out on a, a big photography mission, I will make sure that I line all of my memory cards up and make sure they're all formatted and empty and, and ready to go. And I, I tend to number them so that I can put them in order in my pouch. Um, make sure that you've always got enough memory. That has to be on the checklist. So this is a bit left field, but it's all about what extra thing you can bring to a shoot to really try and boost your creativity. So far, everything we've talked about is about ensuring the smooth running of a photography shoot. This is about really blowing that out of the water and coming up with an idea that is really experimental and a bit out of left field, a bit X factor, Maybe it's about using a lens that you wouldn't normally use, maybe a fisheye lens for some portraits, or a super telephoto for some landscape photography, or a technique that you wouldn't normally use, let's say shooting a really long shutter speed if you were taking pictures of some portraits. Um, it doesn't really matter what it is, maybe it's a prop that you bring, or a, a just an idea that you have. And this is something that I practice a lot in my photography. And even if I'm doing a big commercial shoot, I will run through the shot list, I'll make sure the client gets everything that they need, but then I'll nearly always try and do something else extra as well. Maybe that'll be using a different bit of kit, maybe sometimes it's about using a bit of kit really rather inappropriately, not for its intended purpose, to try and come up with something different. Sometimes it will work, sometimes it doesn't. My clients like it because it means they generally get a, a picture that they're not expecting. Sometimes they'll like it, sometimes they won't. It's kind of irrelevant actually because this is all about just boosting your creativity, taking the top off of your creativity, smearing it with lemon green mustard and then growing a bunch of daffodils out of the ears of it. This is all about going Salvador Dali and coming up with something that's truly unique to you. So I would recommend putting onto your checklist do something extra. Give something a try. It doesn't matter if it doesn't go well, but you won't know if you don't try. So there you go. So there are a few other things on my list, but I don't want to bore you, so I won't go into too much detail. I'm going to leave it there. So thank you very much for watching. I'm sure other people have got other things that they might do before their photography uh, assignment, so do let me know in the comments. And please subscribe and like. As I've said before, this is the smallest photography YouTube channel in the world. So 
please leave me a comment and I will try my best to get back to you. It's nice to have discussions with people and I'm really grateful for all of the new subscribers to this channel. It's been really nice to see people um, subscribing and commenting and liking on my videos. It, you don't know how much it means to me actually. It's, um, it's really important. So thank you very much.